Broadcasting from a shack on a hill. Welcome back to Lighting the Void. I'm your host, Joe Roop. We are broadcasting all the way from Grant County here at Forest Tower in Arkansas. <laughs> We're in the second hour. I want to thank Santos Bonacci for coming on the program. I don't usually do that very often, but I had a pre-record of that interview. And thank God uh, he did that for us. So Because now we got Ramsey Dukes, also known as... Lionel Snell is here with us, and uh, that's what we're going to be talking about next. We're going to be talking with him next. Now, I want to thank our sponsors because we can get a chance to get the T.com, ancientlifeoil.com, and metaphorical archaeology. Also, ufoseekers.com. Make sure you go give them a visit at ufoseekers on Twitter, ufoseekers.com. Go watch all the new seasons if you're into, like, really cool ufology. That's who you need to follow. I don't really... Uh, have any announcements uh, since we're kind of short of time and he's here with us now all the way from uh, cape town R- ramsey dukes is here with us and uh, if if just by any chance you haven't heard i want to read this thing from uh, from his front page and this is i mean i could do the classic bio but this front page is brilliant here on his website at ramseydukes.co.uk he says i'm interested in magic and for me the word magic includes not just ceremonial magic, the occult, the lima, chaos magic, witchcraft, etc., but also astrology, tarot, and all forms of divination, most alternative healing systems, and self-development processes such as individuation, NLP, Scientology, etc. And uh, thank you so much for coming on the program. Back on the program, actually. It's good to have you back. Oh, it's a pleasure for me. And I'm so glad I made it this time after last time when Skype let me down. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, man, it was the coolest thing to, I was talking to my co-host Dan and you called in, didn't expect you to call in and apologize. And I got to say that was really um, stand-upish about you, man, because right. usually when somebody doesn't show up, they just don't really say nothing or they, you know, they say, oh, it's my internet. Mm. But you wanted to call in and, and apologize. And that's, that was really big of you. <laughs> really, thank you. All right. Well, I felt I owed it to you for the honor. <laughs> yeah, you're very welcome. I, I'm, I want to jump off this where with mm. uh, when we talk about magicians. There's a lot of people that, that we got tons of magicians, modern, old that we look up to today. A lot of people do look up to you and follow you and your work. And specifically, we didn't really get to talk about this much the last time. You're on the program, mm. but the Abra Mellon ritual, I don't think people understand what that entails. Uh, they actually made a movie. Mm. Uh, I forget. It was called oh, yes. a, a Dark Song, where the guy said it dark was. Dark Song, yeah. It, yeah. It, mm. Does the real Abra Mellon, just to be clear here, does the real Abra Mellon ritual involve anything like what that movie was portraying? Did you get to see that? Yes, I did. Yeah. And the, the movie was much more exciting than the the real Abra Malin because, um, you know, they put in some rather beautiful rituals with um, pentagrams and, you know, and all, all the stuff. Whereas the first six months of Abra Malin or 18 months, if you apparently, you know, there's they've gone back to the original and they say it should really be 18 months. Um, is really an exercise in s- discipline and strengthening yourself for the magic that is to come. And um, okay. that is the thing which people 
often don't understand. You know, they want wonderful things to happen from day one. And it's it's much harder work than that. Do you think that Aleister Crowley uh, ever really did finish that? Ever made it through? Saw his holy guardian angel? I don't. I don't know. I've read a few yeah. books saying he, that he didn't. And yeah. That's what's going on at Bolas Gun, and they think the yeah. place is haunted. Uh, but you find those people don't really dig and read the research too much about what really went down. But I did hear that he gave up on it, kind of, or just didn't make yes. it through it. Yes, and and most people give, have given up on it. You know, it's um, it's uh, uh, <clears throat> I, I for me it was very important that when you start, you make a vow of what you're going to do. Um, you write down and you say, I undertake this operation and for six months I'll do all I can to invoke my holy guardian angel. And um, I think it's very easy to go into that with an arrogant spirit. I'll do this whatever happens. Uh-huh. And I, I thought now in our modern world, you don't actually have that much power. You know, <clears throat> it's all very well if you're in a desert in the Middle Ages um, say I'll do this, whatever happens. But nowadays, if you're hiding away in the woods somewhere, what if the police decide you're the you're the, the Unabomber or something? You know, you can't. They'll they'll take you away from the place. And one of the vows you make is you'll stay in the same temple for those six months, um, using that temple three times a day. Um, and you just can't do that if. Uh, you become a subject of police action or or what happens if um, a close relative or a parent is in severe, uh, you know, is, has an accident and is severely ill? Are you really going to not go to them and not help out? So what I did is I, I said, I'm going to do, I'm going to commit to this with the very best of my ability. But I recognize that if some... Um, superior outside force uh, makes it impossible for me to do it, I will take that as a message from my holy guardian angel. In other words, I put some of the responsibility back onto the angel, you know, to help me to do this. <clears throat> and so <laughs> okay. I got to the end of the six months. I can't say I did a brilliant job, but I did get to the end of the six months. And I think a lot of people, um, they don't allow for that. And so many things can happen to trip you up. And, um, yeah, so that, to me that was one of the mistakes I think people make. They say, oh, yes, I could do this. It doesn't look too difficult. They read the book, you know. Um, I just have to take the phone off the hook of that. But things will happen to break you. And if you haven't allowed for that, you're for it. So you're saying it's tougher than a football two-a-day camp, in other words, right? <laughs> yes. yes, it is, yeah. It's kind of like it's a tough in, hell week for magicians, I would say, huh? Well, it's tough in very small ways. That's the thing, you see. Um, uh, I'm actually very resilient, so as it were, on the astral plane. You know, uh, so what happened, if I was trying to get to my oratory and I felt great powerful forces forcing me down into the bed or something like that, um, I would fight back. But... If you're going to get to the oratory and then the postman comes with a delivery that needs your signature, um, <laughs> to say, I can't do that because I'm doing a great magical operation from time <laughs> to immemorial, um, you're just drawing attention to yourself. You're causing trouble. You know, um, so it's little f- for me. Um, it was just many, many little things all stacked up like coincidences and um, strange synchronicities to handicap me and make it very difficult to do and that isn't that takes strength actually because uh big fierce things you know seeing a demon or something you can start making pentagrams and banishing and and you can really throw yourself into it but if it's just little niggling things from day to day um all piling up against you that actually takes real persistence and i think that those six months are very much about persistence yeah, persistence is key. I think it is that it's that way with anything. Even even like um well not anything. I just think the important things it is, right? Like um mm. uh, you, there could be you could have a skilled magician that would probably maybe 
go through it a little easier. I don't know. I can tell you this with persistence and podcasting, it's paid off for me. It definitely wasn't skill, oh, yeah. you know, it's just yeah. keep going. Yeah. But, yes. It's a learning thing. And, it, and it's very much a learning thing doing the Abram Lynn. I mean, um, when I started, uh, there was a, a person who was a, um, one of old Crowley's disciples who advised me and he said, when you do it next time, and I thought, well, next time? Surely this is a once-in-a-lifetime thing. <laughs> and I realized, actually, um, if I was had the opportunity, I would have done it again because you learn so much the first time that, um, you know, it's really worth, if you can, doing it a second time because really the first time is a learning time, and I learned a hell of a lot. Yeah, okay. Did mm -hmm. you... When they, you met these uh, entities or these spirits that you have to go through, did you actually see them? Were there any type of paranormal activity that happened? Anything like that? Not, not in that. What what is supposed to happen is um, very much in the in the days after the end of the six months. That's when you meet your holy guardian angel and. In theory, you have a conversation with him, and then he introduces you to these spirits. And um, when that, on that last day, uh, they say the knowledge and conversation of your holy guardian angel. What I felt I got was the knowledge. I could feel the presence, and um, I could feel that something had happened, but I didn't have a two-way conversation. And so... Those last few days for me were very frustrating. They were waiting, expecting something. And what happened was that um, I had a feeling that I hadn't done it long enough, that I should really continue. And, but when I did the E King, it said, go back to normal life. And what happened was for about, for it was seven years, my life was in turmoil after that. And... Um, what I found was that the things that were happening to me were rather, uh, they're sort of analogies of what should happen in those seven days. Uh -huh. um, I was meeting my demons. I was finding deep parts of me um, coming up, you know. And, and so after about the first year, I realized and I thought, saw it in those terms. And so I was sort of acting it out over seven years. And it was really weird. Um, at the end of that, my life completely changed, and I got a, new, a, a job, the first proper job I'd had for a long time, in a new place. I moved to Winchester, and um, I arrived there at night. I'd bought a flat, and I arrived at night with my car full of furniture and stuff that I had to take upstairs. And it was late at night, and I was too tired, so I thought I'll leave it in the car and um, uh, go up and take it in the morning. And as I went up the stairs, I felt my, you know, the hair standing on, uh, my hair standing on end and prickling down my spine, a really eerie feeling. And I realized I was worried because I was leaving the altar all packed up um, in the car. And I thought, no, I can't do that. So I carried it up and um, put it in my bare room. And then I realized it was, was exactly seven years to the day of when the operation ended. And so the next oh, morning wow. I, I, I set it all up, you know, took out, opened the altar, took out my robe and lit the incense and everything. And um, I just had this one message, now you're a magician. Um, and so I took that as that I had actually, in my own terms, I had completed it. Um, but not as it should have been written in the book, you know, but in a sort of an analogous way over a longer period. And it was, um, yeah, it was a real change in my life that. And so it, it was creepy. That, yeah, I bet that does sound creepy and super synchronistic. Like there's no doubt about it. Yeah. Right. Um, mm. so then you probably, would you say that you did come in contact with your holy guardian angel for sure? Yes. Yeah, I certainly had the knowledge of the Holy Guardian Angel. What I didn't have the satisfaction of sort of, you know, I can ask questions and then answers pop into my head. Um, it's a bit like channeling, but it's, it would have been very, I would have 
when I started out, I was hoping I was going to sort of, as it were, stand up, you know, and shake hands with him and have a real man to man conversation. But um, it didn't work out like that for me. Um, well, that's, that's, yeah, but I think that's incredibly, I mean, that's incredibly hard. So I can, I just, mm. I don't know if I could do that. I've been through some tough stuff in my life, but I don't know if I could make it through that. It's all a mental mm. thing, huh? Would you say? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think so. Cause, um, I was interested, you know, uh, it can sound very anticlimactic that to other people, you know, Oh, that's all that happened. Was it? But if I look at Crowley, who has such a great reputation and he didn't, though he didn't ever complete the Avram Lynn, he did, he got the spirit of, you know, doing a retirement, um, yeah, it might be going into the desert or something like that. And he did some very extreme retirements. And in one of the things, he wrote it up in the Equinox as the magical diary of John St. John. And um, uh, he, he wrote something down, which I completely identified with this. He said, this diary, and it was something like, is really the diary of a man um, trying to make sense of his nature. Um, and um, you know, becoming strong through that. It, it, in other words, he was to, he realized that the essence of it is um, if you write it down as a diary, it can sound very boring because it's it's a person struggling to make sense of themselves and to sort of make sense of life. And but that really is the essence of um, of of what this was all about. And I thought, yeah, I can I completely identify with what he said there. And I think that that's, he probably did something similar because although he didn't repeat the Abram Lynn operation, having got the idea of it, of a retirement, and the, you have this aspiration, he then did it in other forms. He created his own um, sort of retirements. And I think that, um, yeah, it's a very valid thing to do. Well, what, what would you say nowadays, especially in the present, with what's happening and what's going on with the astrology and stuff, there's all these retrogrades happening and there's all this chaos mm. on the planet and stuff. If as a magician, when you see that, do you even pay attention to that kind of stuff or do you just like not really do you, do you still just do your own thing? Cause it is affecting a lot of people. There's no doubt about it at mm. this point. Yeah. I'm, there's nothing that's not convinced me that it's not affecting people, you know? Yes, definitely. Yeah, it's, I think that um, uh, an important thing, the magic, people often come into magic looking for power. You know, they feel powerless and they want power. But people who really persist with magic find that what they actually are going for is strength. Um, and uh, so a typical person sort of says, you know, well, I, I wrote it up in a satirical way in a thing. I said, you know, I want to be rich, successful, famous. Um, how can I become rich, successful, famous? Um, hey, there's this thing called magic, which promises to make you rich, successful, and famous. Um, wow, that's great, you know. Um, so what, are the, what is magic about? Magic says, first, I must perfect myself. Wow, how do I know when I'm perfect? It's when you no longer want to be rich, successful, and famous. Oh, shit. Um, <laughs> now, yeah. That's a sort of parody of it, but it, there's something in that because uh, people often come in um, wanting <laughs> certain things and thinking it's going to be an easy route to get them. Now, when I wrote my book about um, magic, comparing it with other cultures, you know, magical versus religious versus scientific versus artistic ways of looking at the world. Um, Crowley said, people think of magic and religion as the same. Actually, they're opposites. And one of the ways they're opposite is that religion is very much a social thing. You know, the strength of religion is how many people are in it and believe it. Um, whether it's uh, a, pol a political religion like communism or whether it's a, you know, a, a theistic religion like Christianity. It's a, it's a group thing. Whereas magic, very often the power of magic is in secrecy. It's very much what it does to you as an individual. And very often if you tell other people, um, they say, oh, that's a load of rubbish or that's a coincidence, something like that. So it's, it's much more personal. And so for something like people who want to make money, 
a lot of people practice money magic. And what typically happens is it delivers what you need more than what you want. And that is very interesting. Um, I'll give you one example from my life. There was a time when my life was really drab. I was stuck in a nine to five job yeah. and I bought a motorcycle, a solo motorbike, a motor guzzi, a state of the art. And the first day I was too timid, but the second day when I got the hang of it, I was coming home from work. I was swooping down a country lane and I shouted out, this is freedom. <laughs> it was a most amazing feeling. And then when I look back, I realized that, um, uh, about a year ago, I'd done a, a, a sigil work, you know, like Abram Lynn, where you, you make a sigil and you get it into your unconscious. And it was that I wanted money. And how do you say how much money you want? It, I was stuck in this job. I wanted the money to buy freedom. And um, now, of course, when you do that, you're supposed to forget. It goes down to the unconscious. You forget about it. And so I had forgotten about it. There was, what had happened meanwhile was that um, uh, my brother's uh, mother-in-law had died and he'd inherited money. And he was able to repay money I'd give him for deposit on a house, £2,000. Now, I'd given him that money. I wasn't expecting it back. But he said, no, I'm going to pay it back to you. So I had £2,000, which could have either bought me a good but boring car, a Volkswagen Golf, or this really exotic motorbike. And I decided to go with the exotic motorbike. So there, there was I shouting, this is freedom. And I realized I'd got the money to buy freedom, but it was not the freedom that I, it had literally, it had done what I wanted, what I asked for, but actually it had provided what I needed, not what I wanted. And that is sort of very typical and there was a crazy example. Um, I heard you uh, listen to the podcast Weird Studies. No, I haven't. Do you know? Sure. It's haven't. a very good podcast, and they discuss things like that. And one of the people on it, I think it was J.F. Martel, um, he described, um, he did a, a sigil operation for a, a large sum of money. And the next day, he got a check for something measly like, you know, $60 or something. I've had that happen to me several times, though, yeah. just to be honest with and, you. And he looked at the check, and I, I don't know if you can remember what checks were like, but they, they say, to pay so-and-so, the sum of, in great big letters, and then you write the amount of money. And so he looked at his check. And it hit him like a bolt. There was the sum of written large. He had a large written sum of a <laughs> tiny amount of money. Uh. And, um, yeah, you see, um, that was like a huge anticlimax. But it actually was what he needed because it taught him something about magic. Um, and here was a, several years later, he was able to give that as an example of his learning about magic and how what happens is very often weird synchronicities crop up, yeah. weird happenings. And, um, uh, but they're things you can learn from. Um, they teach you things. And that is part of the strengthening thing. You know, you go in thinking, oh, yeah, I could do this. I could wave my magic wand and have a pile of money. But you actually find out things that you've got to be really clear about what you want. You know, that's a one lesson. Um, you've got to be sure, do you actually need this? Why do you want it? Maybe it's something wrong with you you want it. You know, you're learning things like that. And it's very much a growth path. And um, so those are two crazy examples, but they're very typical. You know, when you hear magicians talking about their money magic, it's usually the check comes for just what they need for a particular thing rather than, you know, a vast fortune. If I was, if I wanted to make a big fortune, um, I would, I would do it with through religion. Um, because magic, uh, money is actually a social thing. Like, like it's the more people believe in it, the more powerful it is. It's like a religion. Yeah. So, um, I wouldn't, um, go into a little room and do a spell, I would uh, think up some religious slogan like, um, say, Trump is Christ reborn. 
and I'd put that on T-shirts. I'd put it on um, baseball caps, and I'd go and stand in the street and make hot speeches about, you know, um, Trump is Christ reborn, that sort of thing. That's yeah. where you would make money. <laughs> Religion is much better for making money on the big way like that, you know. Yeah, yeah. it's, um, it's hmm. never been a... I got to tell you, and I got into magic because I had some astral travel experiences. I never really got into it for manifesting, but the more I, un the more I understood, well, at least the ceremonial side of it, um, mm. it started making me realize, like, damn, do I want to do this? Because this is, sounds like a rough mm. journey here. You know, <laughs> like, I don't know. Yeah. If, mm. I don't know if I want to go through yeah. this, but it's paid in dividends. I mean, each hard thing that I've been through has led me to something better but sometimes better and harder too it's hard to explain mm, yeah um, well it's a, you see uh, to me power and strength people think of them as the same thing but it, actually they're compliments um you know um uh you see an interest in magic and these sort of subtle currents and things probably helped you with lockdown because if all your life is simply through, you know, who you meet and going into work in the office, that sort of thing, yeah, you don't spend that much time sort of exploring things on your own internally. Now, if you've been doing that and you're in lockdown, you can look at the things happening in the world and you can sort of see them as currents, as egregores, as, as um, demons at work. And that that is quite that is interesting in itself it's you know it gives you it gives you a fresh outlook on things um and you're not quite so uh dependent on um outside things entertaining you it's uh, uh yeah it's helped me uh, during lockdown you know to to understand things and to get a feeling for what's going on well i am getting, i don't know i had a little fun during covid but for the most part it hasn't been a pleasant journey i can tell you that but mm. then again it's like what that's it's all about perception too i mean so we, we can't group mm. up into hundreds of people or whatever but you can still go out in nature mm. you can still go out with a few friends you can still mm. uh do yeah, yeah like a lot of internal work or catch up on some books you need to read and yeah. things like that yeah you know? one of the things that um uh, some people were saying is that particularly at the beginning of lockdown when it was when it was severe was it was almost like nature came flowing back into the world right, you know yeah. people went out into parks and there were animals there which normally would be away as soon as light came and people came in you know the, the silence and the um the, the lack of cars the lack of airplanes I mean, we've got cars back now, but we still don't have airplanes flying over. Um, uh, so it was like nature was sort of seeping back into our lives. Now, it's rather, that's one of the things I miss as lockdown begins to get easier. That silence and um, uh, sense of the natural world is, is, is going back, is retreating. But it was a beautiful thing, and it was a good thing to be reminded that it was there waiting Um behind all the noise and the bustle and everything. Nature is actually still there, but it's in hiding. Well, yeah, that's a hundred percent true. The, the, the egregores though, that's an interesting thing to me. Like, um, even, I don't know what I'd want to admit here, but even like when you join a secret society and you join there, whether it's the golden Dawn, to Lima, whatever group you join, you got to be mm. careful with that because they have an egregore too. Like they have yeah. their own energies involved yes. with that, right? So mm. is it better to be a, yeah. would you say it's better to be a solo practicing magician or is there any benefit of joining like societies or covens nowadays, mm. anything like that? Well, um, going back to that thing about, you know, the religion being the thing that binds people together into groups and magic is very much a solo thing. Um, of course, the two things also work together. Um, now, you know, for instance, a lot of things which are accepted in religion are actually magic. Um, if you have a statue of a saint in a Catholic church, mm -hmm. uh, it's a physical object which people 
kneel down in front of in order to get in contact with God. It's almost like, you know, like a telephone or sort of thing. Um, now, uh, doing that brings spirit down into that object. So it becomes a holy object, a sacred object. And that actually is an act of magic. When you bring spirit down into matter, that's the direction that magic goes in. So like, you know, a new ager gets a crystal, a piece of quartz, and will wash it, cleanse it, and bless it. And it becomes a power object. Um, that is bringing spirit down into matter. So really, um, this bowing down before saints, statues and things is an act of magic. We think, well, why does the church allow that? Because it doesn't like magic. It's because the purpose, the overall purpose, is to take people up to God. You, know, you kneel in front of this thing, and it's like you conversing with God. And so that's why it's accepted. But if you're a very strict religious person, you know, like the, the Puritans, they don't like that because they see it's magic, and they call it idolatry, because they realize that after a while, people are actually worshipping the statue as if that's a god because it becomes so powerful yeah. and an egregore is built up around it and so that's why the puritans went around and smashing statues and things you know terrible artistic destruction but it was with this realization and islam is like that you know you're not allowed to show a representation of muhammad um because people men would then start bowing down to that representation um, that's the sort of part of the thinking behind it. Um, so you mustn't represent him. Um, you must always have your attention on the real Muhammad. And um, so it's a tension there that, uh, so in religion, there's a lot of magic takes place, but you have to, they have to make sure that it's directed up towards the religious aim and it doesn't just become magic in its own right. Now, um, so when I gave that example of um, uh, if I wanted to make money, I would take a religious track. Really, I was describing a magical operation, but using sort of uh, religious principles. Um, and um, so uh, joining a magical group is really sort of joining a mini religion because that group sets out shared beliefs and shared practices um you're committing yourself to a sort of a small religion and that has got its strength it's you know, it's a powerful thing to do but the nature of these uh, religious things they form an egregore which is a sort of a spirit which has its own its own um individual being so the egregore uh, one of the things it does, it defends itself by casting out people that don't fit. Um, let's, let's take a sort of political example. Uh, communism was a very powerful egregore that built up from the works of Marx. And um, one of the forms of communism was Stalinism, which took over Russia. Now, the Stalinists um, killed off the Trotskyites and various and in your know, various other forms of communism they destroyed them because they were a risk to stalinism and um this is a thing that happens in religion you know throughout the christian history there have been many many heretics and heresies like manichaeism um there was the cathars uh which really believed the same fundamental things but they had a slightly different spin on it um, I can't remember, there was one very early on which said that Christ was a messenger from God. You know, they took everything Christ said, they accepted the Gospels and everything, but they said he wasn't actually God himself, he was a messenger from God. Um, but on the strength of that, they had to be cast out and destroyed, and they, you know, they were burnt alive for being heretics, things like that. So, um, uh, if you join a, a magical order... It's a very good way of learning magic, and you get a lot from it. But if you begin to um, have doubts about it, or you begin to want to do it a bit differently, you see this happening in these orders, um, you're liable to be cast out. It's like a cult. You know, in a cult, um, you can get a hell of a lot from a cult. It can be very nourishing. It can be very supportive. 
But if you say, um, yeah, but my, my parents are ill and I want to go back to them to help them, um, you're liable to be thrown out. No, your duty is to the cult, not to your parents. You made a vow. Um, and it isn't just they say, go away. They actually demonize you after that. You know, other members of the cult are not allowed to contact you anymore. Um, you're, you're completely cut off. And um, some magical orders are better than others, but there's a bit of that that happens. You know, you find yourself locked into a system if you're not careful. And you have to um, be very wary about that. Because an egregore, uh, it sort of absorbs people, takes you over if you're not careful. It's difficult to keep it at arm's length. Yeah, it's a powerful it. thing. Get a lot I from it, that. but yeah, so, that's the downside. So, mm. like, well, if I'm like, say this, I'm doing this radio show, and I and I, and I call the, these people that that are like, I look at my listeners like family. A mm. lot of them have been here for a long time, and we, I call them, yeah. you know, void walkers or whatever. Am I creating mm. an egregore when I do that? Yeah, yeah, I think so. It's a, it's it's a, it's, it's quite a gentle egregore because you don't lay down um uh you don't lay down rules, I presume, you know, um like if you listen to this program and you don't believe in UFOs, I'm sorry, you can't you're not allowed to listen to it. No. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's when it would become a sort of malignant egregore. It starts to exercise power like that. Your your yours is a teaching egregore. A stimulating to think egregore, I'd say. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's pretty benign. But um, you see, you might have um, uh, your logo, you know, the, um, you might put your logo on T-shirts and baseball caps. And so people who identify with your program would wear them. And then they walk down the street, and they see someone else and immediately feel a bond with them. Hey, you, you listen to Joe Roop too, do you? Oh, that's great. Um, uh, and that, you see, becomes a, a social thing. It's like that's how the egregore spreads. Um, people find they've got something in common. Complete stranger, but he's wearing the same, he's wearing your T-shirt, same as his. Um, yeah. You know, hey, hey that's it. it becomes a family. Yeah, I just mm. don't want it to be, a, a, when I hear that word egregore, it makes me feel, mm. it, it doesn't feel good sometimes, you know, because egregores mm. can be bad, I think, too, sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. When I, when I, I gave, um, on my YouTube channel, I gave, uh, a talk about egregores because I'd, I'd read the book you mentioned, um, by, can't remember the name, just say the name Mark of the guy Stavish. again. Yeah. Mark Savage, that's it. I read his excellent book on it. And so I gave a talk about it. And right at the beginning, I said, you know, I haven't spoken about egregores until now because, um, it's a piece of jargon. And because I have to write for IT companies, I'm really averse <laughs> to jargon. I hate it. Um, but I said, actually, it's a very useful piece of jargon. So I'm going to talk about it. And, um, so I, I, you know, I wasn't sort of quick to use the word, but I realized it is, it explains something very definite and it's a good word from that point of view. And, uh, well, yeah. If a person it, it, starts an egregore of some kind, mm, what kind of things could happen to that person if they're not careful? You see? Yeah. Well, well, one thing, um, I'll just say about starting an egregore is that, there's two ideas. The one is the egregore is something built up by humans. Okay. Um, you know, that uh, say, um, well, take the example of uh, communism, you know, that um, right. Karl Marx wrote some ideas and other people said, hey, that's interesting. You know, let's, um, and then it sort of angles and other people and it's sort of built up into this movement. And so it really looked like Karl Marx started this thing which grew, planted the seed, and it grew and grew, and it was his thing. But there's another idea of egregores, is that there are things, there are pre-existing egregores out there. So um, let's say you started a religion which was about a warrior religion. You know, mm -hmm. um, we're not wimps, we're, we're warriors, we're um, tough, that sort of thing. And you, you start a religion like that. Now, this theory says that actually there is already out there a god of war. There always has been Mars, 
um, RAs, the Greek god of war. Yeah. Every culture's got his god of war. That egregore is out there. So when you think you're creating this religion, um, you're actually contacting and connecting up to an existing egregore. Um, and so that is one of the ways these things can get out of control. Uh, you may think, I'm just starting this thing up. Um, I'm laying down the rules. Um, but let's go back to Karl Marx and communism. Um, long before he was there, there was always an idea of, um, well, it's in Christianity, isn't it, that the poor should inherit the earth, the you know, meek should inherit the earth, right. you know, that um, people who are downtrodden have got a right to... Um, to uh, being agents, yeah, um, and so uh, he didn't really invent communism absolutely from scratch. It was this idea was out there, and he sort of connected up to it, and people saw his works as a way of you know putting this forward. Um, so uh, that's something um, you can think that you're creating an egregore, building something from scratch. But it's you're really it's just attaching very, yourself to it that's already existing. Right? Yes, that's it. It's very unlikely. I mean, it obviously have, have new things. Like if you did it over the internet, well, that's not a traditional thing. Internet's very new. Um, but uh, the basic principles are very likely to be things that are already out there, um, and um, I think that happens with a lot of these cults. Uh, yes, a cult, you know. I don't think anyone sets up to make a cult. Um, I'm going to create this cult, which means I'll have sex slaves. <laughs> I don't think many people start like that. It's I go to um, this is a horrible world. I, I go to spread peace and love. I'm going to create a family. And then yeah. um, so they create this family and it's all very wonderful and everyone's all very loving. But then you just begin to discover the guy leading it. Um, is sleeping with all the women in it. <laughs> right, know? like a uh, Waco, and, that thing, right? Yeah, that's yeah. it, yes, Waco. And, sort of, and the other thing, um, the, the real telling thing is paranoia. Um, ah, okay. Uh, we're this family, but the as rest of the world is against us. You know, we're a family because we're standing out against the rest of the world. And that is a really bad sign. Yeah. You know, that's the time to get out of any cult. Um, and um, that whole self-righteous that, uh, mentality. Yeah. Um, yes. That, I got you. And you see that that take, that latches onto a great big egregore, which all religions have to be careful of. You know that um, if you're not with us, you're against us. Um, uh, and uh, say that gives a lot of religions a lot of strength, but it can be a very very bad thing. Well, the one we started here is it simply says uh, we don't know the answers to anything. We don't claim to know the answers to anything, but we like asking questions pretty much through exploring that is, consciousness. That's that about true. it. Yes. That, I think, is really good because that uh, it, that leaves the door open to anyone. You know, if you want to ask questions, come in. Um, uh, it, it doesn't say... We ask questions. You can ask questions as long as they're not about something else. You know? <laughs> right, right. As long as they're not. Yeah, yeah no, no, no. Yeah. I ain't like that. And it's definitely not like mm. Waco. I'm, I've locked myself yeah. out yeah. down here in the woods, so it's definitely not yeah. like that. Trust me. Mm. But uh, I'm. I think it's so interesting to study these things because it's like, are they really these big entities, and what what? are there roles in the astral realm? Are they visible things? Mm. Uh, are, are they full of color? When you talk about astral travel, uh, have you had mm. any like local experiences where you, where you see your body or you can see the local atmosphere or, or yes, really? yes, I have not very often. And it you know, it's more often it happens rather than, um, me trying to make it happen. Um, I, I obviously, I have, I have, done that sometimes you know, like if i'm doing when i do the um banishing ritual of a pentagram uh you know the lesser banishing ritual of a pentagram um where you draw the pentagrams of the four quarters and all that uh now i'm often in circumstances where people might see me in the distance and i don't want to look weird i don't because um uh, this thing about not looking weird this is very much about the magical privacy thing is that uh 
it's all very well to say, I'm not ashamed of being a magician. You know, I'm going to put on a robe and, and wave my sword in the air. Um, it creates curiosity in other people and that interferes. So um, it's quite normal to be low key with your magic. So, OK, there are, are my um, wanting to banish and cleanse the space I'm in. So I don't stand up and um, and wave my arms in pentagrams of the four corners and shout out the God words. Uh, I sit down and I stand up in my astral or etheric or whatever you call it body and go around the circle around me. So I am aware of my body staying there. And I'm not brilliant at visualization, so I don't see it absolutely clearly, but I can, I'm aware of my body being there and I can sort of get a glimpse of it as I go around. But I'm actually concentrating on those pentagrams that I'm drawing and those are the things I'm making vivid. So, yeah, so that's a deliberate thing and it's not very powerful. What is much more powerful, the odd times when I've um, been half asleep waking up and I can see the room and I can see around it and... I can see myself there and I realize yeah. that I have to actually open my eyes. And huh. usually that jolts me back into the body, but you know, that is very vivid and, and really quite weird. Um, and to say it ha it's more a thing that happens than, than um, my deliberately trying to make it happen. But uh, some people are really good at astral projection and you know, they can just make that happen. Um, but I, uh, my, my visualization is not so brilliant. My youth mm. Yeah. Until, I, it's I almost quite a, like I used to be until I really, really, really person. wanted to do it. And then, yeah, then it didn't work anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's it, yes. It's a lustful result, isn't it? That, yeah. That, um, the, yeah. Mm. How does that work in yes, magic, I, a lust for result? Does that interfere? Um, I think it's. I think it's to do with that thing I said, is that magic has a way of, because it's an individual thing, it has a way of giving you what you need rather than what you want. Yeah. Um, and this is um, every time your magic has sort of tricked you, let you down mm -hmm. or something like that. It's actually an opportunity to learn something. Um, uh, often it's a bigger picture thing. I One analogy I've had of... Um, uh, magic comparing magic with science for instance as i said science is is like religion it's a group thing you know um if uh so going out to do something in a scientific spirit is a bit like i say going to pick apples at an orchard someone says there's an orchard out there and um, they come back with a basket of apples you go out there and you can fill your basket of apples you come back everyone agrees there's apples out there you could do it magic is more like a gold rush. Someone says there's gold in those hills and you can go to that hill and you could, if you approach it scientifically, what you do is say, okay, I'm going to go to 10 random places on this hill, take a sample of rock, take them back, see if there's any gold in them. If there isn't, I know it's a load of rubbish. But a, uh, but a gold miner goes to that hill with the will, I must find the gold that's in that hill. And you could actually spend a whole year and not find anything. Um, does that mean that there isn't gold in the hill? No, you still believe it, but you feel you failed. Yeah. Now, the thing is that, um, uh, let's say you had spent six months looking for gold and you'd thrown yourself into it. You know, mm -hmm. in, in magic, you throw yourself into it. If you don't find, not like the scientists, or I've done the six tests and there's nothing there, so I'm coming back. Um, you really believe it and you will it. And you'll do anything. You know, I'll try dowsing. I'll try um, reading the tarot to see if I'm on the right lines. I'll yeah. look at the astrological info. I'll do anything. I must find that gold. Now, if after six months you haven't found it, you could say, well, it didn't work. I'm a failure. It sure feels what like you could that. do. Yeah. What you could do is go back to the town, the gold mining town, and put up a big notice which says, hey, new coming um, gold prospectors, 
uh, you could, um, I can tell you 10 secrets that you should, things that you should avoid if you're going to find gold, 10 <laughs> mistakes okay. that you could make. Yeah. For $50, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a one day course and what not to do. And, and you might well make out much more money than most of the people who are digging for gold <laughs> because you realize that um, gold in those hills, you've learned so much in those six failure months that you actually got something to pass on to other people that is worth more than the guide of gold you might have found. And there's a saying, you know, which are the people who really make money in a gold mining town are the people who sell shovels and picks. They're the ones who make the fortune. <laughs> right. um, so magic is a lot like that, you know, that um, uh, uh, me shouting out, this is freedom. When I had, I was, you know, the wonderful feeling of slicing through the air on a motorbike, a solo motorbike, where you just lean into the corners and everything. Um, I had found something that I really needed in my constrained nine to five job work that was driving me crazy. Um, and it wasn't the freedom that I thought I needed or wanted, but it was actually, uh, it was really what I needed at that point in my life. And, um, I'd learned something about magic in the process. You know, all those things are strengthening. Wow. That's fantastic advice because some of the bigger things that I've uh, tried to bring into my life through. My so when it comes to like magic, I've ne I don't really try to manifest little bitty things like cash mm. and stuff like that. Usually don't. It's mm. usually like mm. really the big fulfilling things. And then I end up, um, I end up, yeah, you're right, learning a lot. Maybe I should, mm. maybe I should put up a sign and said, this is what not to do. Don't do this. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah, that's it. Yes, that's it. Common mistakes made by tyro magicians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, actually, there's, a, there's an interesting thing in that is that um, there's an exercise which actually comes from the a new age, but it is a, a I, I, I presented this um, to the IOT um, magic group Uh around about 1990 it was um you know this thing the new age thing where you you write an affirmation um yeah. you know there you are um a poverty stricken wage slave um i want to be rich oh yes no they say no no not i want to be rich i will be rich or i am rich you know want to means you're just confirming the position you're going to stay wanting it you know so do you, do you know what i mean with this thing of making an affirmation you yeah. probably you're yes. sure oh yeah conquer. yeah that's it. okay so um first correction to say i want to be rich is not an affirmation it's a admitting for what what you are at present so you'll say i will be rich or i am becoming rich so you write that down um and uh the ordinary thing is you just every day you look at the mirror and you say, I'm becoming rich, I'm becoming rich. You keep saying it and all that. And the idea is it's like the secret, you know, you picture yourself being rich and you're going to become rich. Now, what the, this exercise did said, get a big sheet of paper and write it down again and again and again and again and again until it becomes really boring. You're writing down, I, I am becoming rich, I'm becoming rich, I'm becoming rich. And then you find that things pop into your mind like subconscious speaks back at you after a while as you get bored writing this and it might say something like um i hate those rich bastards <laughs> okay. and you realize you want to be rich because um you hate the people who own these it companies that can make your life hell and you want to be richer than then so you can shut them down or you know buy them up and close them down or something um and you realize that uh driving it is a deep hatred of rich people then you see you realize that what you were wanting was paradoxical you're wanting to be, become rich but you hate rich people so you're wanting to become something that you hate hmm. so that your soul is divided. Um, so um, uh, doing this exercise, what you don't stop there. What you've done is you say, I'm becoming rich. I'm becoming rich. 
um, you realize that um, it was the wrong affirmation because it was an affirmation that clashed. Um, and so you write a new affirmation, taking that into account. Um, and uh, oh, I can't do it quickly, but it might be something like, um, uh, I want enough money not to be a wage slave. Well, that's a bit clumsy. I think you do better than that. You know, um, it's, it's you, oh, no, I mustn't be I want again. <laughs> Same mistake. Um, uh, I'm, I have enough money to be my own person. There you go. It might be something like that, you see. And so, and then you write that down again, 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 again. And then something might pop into your mind like, but I don't like myself. <laughs> I want enough money to be myself, and I don't actually like myself. Yeah, oh, right. um, you know, it, and that's the process, basically. You know, um, each step, you repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, until your subconscious comes up with how it feels about it. And a lot of the Austin Spare stuff, you see, was, a, was about that. You know, um, making a sigil, you write down your, your desire and you make it into a sigil so it's no longer recognizable. Um, because that idea is that, uh, you know, if you just keep saying something which you don't really believe in, you're just asking for resistance. Whereas if you put a sigil where you no longer recognize it, then it can sink down into your unconscious. And then you try to forget what you've done. So it it's, it's becomes a free thing in your unconscious. Um, this is another way of getting around it. it it's um, you, you think you know what you want. And then you discover that actually in your unconscious, there's real resistance to that, which has been stopping you getting it. And so you work on those resistances, yeah. either to um, come to terms with them or to find that actually what you really need is a bit different from what you first wrote down and you gradually refine it. And, gotcha. uh, okay. Um, well, speaking of, so that's pretty fundamental. Yeah. Well, mm. speaking of coming to the end of it, that we're at the end of the, the broadcast here. So thank you for coming on the show. Yeah. It was cool to have you back. Learned a lot actually. Oh. So, Oh, great. Yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Joe. This is, um, yeah, it's been a good exercise for me. Strengthen me. I'm finding <laughs> clarifying my ideas. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, it's it's helped me in in uh, a lot of ways. Hang out just one second here, uh, Ramsey. We got to roll out of here because the secret teachings is coming up with Ryan Gable. Make sure you guys check out the website RamseyDukes.co.uk and check out all of his writings. Also, the YouTube channel. Uh, thank you, Pacho. Thank you, guys. The Fringe FM chat. The Fringe FM team. The patrons. I love each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart. We'll see you guys tomorrow night. Good night.